Welcome viewers to thinktechhawaii.com. Our show today is The Will of the People, and I am Ian Ross, sitting in as host for Martha E. Randolph. My guest today is an educator, former secretary treasurer of HSTA, an active participant in Hawaii's labor movement, and recently elected state representative. Representative Amy Peruso, welcome and thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Uh, before we go any further, uh, what else would you like our viewers to know about you? Uh, I think being an educator has definitely been an important part of um, who I've become, but I think it's also important to know maybe that I am a mother and mm -hmm. um, I take that very seriously and I enjoy surfing and um, working with the community. Great. Yeah. Um, so I understand that you also taught social studies at Milani High School for 14 years. Now that you're a legislator, are there some sort of lesson or fact that you've learned that you'd want to add to the social studies curriculum? Oh, so that's a good question. I think that, um, you know, it's not necessarily true that I'd want to add anything to mm -hmm. the curriculum, but I definitely think that I'd want to go deeper with work that I was already doing or mm -hmm. starting to do. So I was doing a lot of work, um, and throughout my career I've been kind of developing this approach to civic education mm -hmm. that's very place-based and very um, culturally grounded. And I think that um, if I was still in the classroom, I, I think having this experience of the legislature, um, I would definitely be doing that work more aggressively mm. with more intention and more um, kind of uh, understanding of, it, of its importance. Interesting. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, though I understand you may be a new legislator, as I was kind of mentioning for some of your background, you've been involved in the political process for some time. Um, so my question for you is, be beyond just teaching, uh, what can you tell me about experiences that you've had in the past that prepared you for your current job? Well, um, <laughs> I'm not sure uh, if anything really prepared me, <laughs> but I think that being involved in movement politics for mm. most of my adult life, starting in Los Angeles around um, environmental racism and, mm. and um, just social justice movements, labor movements, I think that that work really prepared me for thinking about the relationship between elected officials and the people um, and thinking about the importance of organizing. So that's been really pivotal for me. And if I, I think back on um, the kinds of strategies I developed mm -hmm. um, in, in helping to organize movements and what I learned from the people leading those movements um, and how they still inspire me. I, I think that I take to work with me every day. So you're mentioning uh, different types of like tactics you learned in mm -hmm. movements. Can you give any examples? I think it sounds very basic, mm -hmm. but I think listening to people and engaging in the one-on-one -on -one conversation and um, really trying to hear the sources of people's frustration mm -hmm. and cynicism and alienation and trying to work with them to tap back into the causes of that frustration. So what are the, the shared obstacles, right? And how can we address those together? Mm. Um, I think that's why organizing is so powerful because you're working collectively to make change. Sounds like a skill that probably has been aiding you well as a legislator then. Well, I'm still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that I, 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 it's a skill I want to continue to develop. So, um... So I can see now, looking backward, there's some of a clear path towards where you are now. When did you first know that you wanted to run for office? Uh -huh. So I think that I had, you know, I never actually intended to run for office. Mm -hmm. It was never part of my life plan. Mm -hmm. I never saw myself in elected office, and I was very comfortable being an educator and being involved in movement politics, especially the labor movement. I felt like I was doing good work there. And I think it was um, the evening of the 2016 general election when, um, so I might get a little emotional, but I um, have two younger daughters. Mm -hmm. So at the time, one was 12 and one was 10. And they had um, been, um, they had been very involved in the whole political discussion. We'd let them watch everything like, um, surrounding the election because I thought it would be a good instruction about how ultimately the people will make the right decision, mm -hmm. right? And, and even though from my perspective, um, we had a misogynist racist running, um, it, that it, there was no possibility 
that for me, from my perspective, that we would elect that person to be president. Mm -hmm. And um, I think my daughters shared that perspective. And, and I think they were really inspired by the candidacy of, of Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. And um, while I was not a, <laughs> an original Clinton supporter, um, I supported them in that. And we had conversations about politics all the time, which was not normal for them. They're not, they're not yet political young women, and or they weren't at the time. And the evening of that election and watching their faces, they had made signs that said, Hillary for the win, and <laughs> drawings and like posted them around the mm -hmm. house. And um, watching their faces, watching the results come in, I just decided whatever I was doing, it wasn't enough. So. Um, it was that at that moment that I knew I wasn't sure that I would be running for office, but it seemed clear to me like I that night I signed up to go to the Women's March. I um, I, I realized that I was going to have to level up. Mm. So and that's what it looks like now. But yeah. Well, obviously you're part of it. So, but what does it mean to you then and your daughters? See, in 2018, so many more women elected, uh, including here in the state legislature um, here in Hawaii and uh, national and all the women now jumping into the 2020 presidential election. Yeah, I think that it's um, frankly really fabulous. And I've been thinking about what the legislator, legislature would look like and what our legislative agenda would look like mm -hmm. um, if it was a legislature dominated by women. I've been thinking about that because um, you get this real sense that there's a shift already happening mm -hmm. and you know, it, it, outcomes are never clear, but when I was running for office, and so I would teach all day, and then I'd go home and I'd take a short nap, and then I'd go canvas every day, and my daughters watched me do this, and um, at first, they were very um, hesitant to be involved, and they were not sure they supported me, you know, mm -hmm. because it, I, I think for them, it seemed like a stretch, right? And they were a little bit nervous for me. This Probably they, after the 2016 experience. Right, too. and they knew that this was not part of my life plan, and mm -hmm. they knew how much I loved doing the work with HSTA, and they knew how much I loved being in my classroom. So they were not convinced mm -hmm. that this was going to be the right path for me. Um, but I think that as they started to see people's response to me and to the vision and to those conversations, um, my daughters actually started supporting me. <laughs> and, An important endorsement, to be sure. <laughs> right. Right, but I mean, started to like think positively about the possibility of mm -hmm. women being in office. So that, for me, was a major win. Um, well, clearly, your family and what was going on nationally were uh, motivators and uh, drove you towards this. But when you were first starting out, did you also have any particular advisors and mentors? And if so, how did they affect you? Uh, I think that um, I, over the course of the past decade, I think I've really changed. Mm -hmm. um, I've become much more political. I think that that is a result of what's happened in public education nationally mm -hmm. and locally. And I think my main mentors, I think around organizing it was the Chicago teachers, like the UCOR teachers mm -hmm. and, and Eric Gill locally. Mm -hmm. um, I think around education politics, the people who have inspired me or mentored me have been um, Daryl Galera, Catherine Payne. Um, and I think that um, those folks have really had a powerful impact on how I think about politics. In, in electoral politics, it's been mostly Gary Hoosier locally, and um, surprisingly, uh, our national NEA leader, Lily Eskelson Garcia, oh, okay. encouraged me to get involved in electoral politics when I wasn't sure. So Sounds like a lot of mentors in a lot of different places. Yeah, different kinds of mentoring. Yeah, That's great. Um, so you... So how has becoming a state representative changed how you push for those issues that you care about? Hmm. Um, so it has changed who I am publicly. Mm -hmm. So I have the same passions, the same drive, and I think I express them differently. I think I'm much more prone, or I hope that I am um, able or willing to see the whole. I think as an advocate or um, an activist, uh, it was easy for me to identify the right solution mm -hmm. and to fight for it. And I think having to listen to um, multiple sides makes you be more reflective. Interesting. And, and uh, uh, I feel more responsible for um, 
hearing and, and listening to hear. So talking about like uh, the chance opportunities to listen and hear people, you of course sit in a lot of hearings, especially where you <laughs> yeah. vice chair uh, higher and lower education, one of the yes. two vice chairs. Um, so do you have any specific examples of some issues that you've been, you found it very informative to be hearing more sides about? Hmm. I think, um, well, in those hearings, I think that um, I'm, I'm very comfortable in those hearings. I've spent, <laughs> I feel like I've spent a lot of my life in those hearings, mm -hmm. but on the other side. So what was interesting about that process was being able to ask questions mm -hmm. um, that came from a different perspective, that came from a teacher perspective. And um, I know that it, it, the hearings felt different to me. So I hope that teachers, like just in the way that our questions are now in that space in a different way, um, that we might be heard in a different way. And it's mm. odd because I, I have this kind of schizophrenic identity. I still see myself as a teacher, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so oftentimes it's hard for me to uh, separate the two. Okay, well, kind of transitioning from that. So you now have experience uh, teaching people about policy, advocating for policy, uh, and now voting and crafting policy. If someone came to you and they said they wanted to get involved and make a difference in their community, where would you tell them to start? Ah, so I think it would depend on the, the age of that person mm -hmm. and the social context within which they live and work. Um, but I think that I would ask them to start where they're at. Right, to look around their workplace or their school mm -hmm. and to start talking to folks about issues that are of common concern. And then to start talking to people about acting to address those issues. And I think that in my experience as a teacher, um, activating people and engaging them and politicizing them, um, sometimes it doesn't matter so much the specific issue it, it what matters is that feeling of empowerment that happens as a result when you're working with other people so because that's transferable mm -hmm. um and so you can take that to other issue areas and and as and even if you think that a person like you might have be having a conversation or i might be having a conversation with a young person mm -hmm. and i might think that um they've chosen a trivial issue you know um, but as I ask them to go talk to other people and see if other people share that concern, they will discover that for themselves, whether or not this is a burning issue for mm -hmm. others and if they can organize around that issue. So uh, I, I really think the workplace is the most important place, but okay. also the school site, because that's where young people are working. <laughs> well, as you know, uh, we're just about to start the new round of neighborhood board elections. Yes. Uh, I know that uh, for representatives, uh, a big part of constituent outreach is attending these board meetings and working with them. What have you seen that role between you and the board as so far in your tenure? I think that, um, well, I had attended board meetings for a long time and actually the board meetings were mm -hmm. a reason that I considered running for office because um, I, when we start, first did the research that laid the foundation for our schools, our Kiki Deserve mm -hmm. campaign, um, we created that campaign and then I took it out to the neighborhood boards. So I went to the neighborhood boards. I don't think I hit all of them, but myself and some of my HSC colleagues went to most of the neighborhood boards, mm -hmm. shared our campaign, asked for the board support, um, and we would go back multiple times. And uh, for me, it was a really interesting process because it was a little bit heartbreaking mm. um, because it led me to the realization that our neighborhood boards are so, generally speaking, mm. um, divested from the public schools because the city and county don't fund those schools. So they don't feel responsible for the schools. Mm. There's very little to no conversation at the neighborhood boards around public education. It's mostly, you know, about municipal issues, yes. right? Yeah. Um, Being a board member, I've definitely noticed that. <laughs> right? And, and so for me, it, it, I had known that kind of on a conceptual level, but then experienced uh, board members, not disinterest, but they could not see the connection between what I was talking about and what they were interested in. So um, it, it really brought home to me the importance of... Um, having multiple levels of government engage in this discussion on public education. 
because it cannot just be the state's responsibility. Um, it has to um, come down to the local level. And there are very few parents involved in school community council meetings. Um, if that's our level of local accountability, then our, our system won't be successful. So I'm really hoping that the neighborhood board and the city and county can somehow get engaged, engaged in the conversation around public education. Well, I think it's a really important insight, especially because as you mentioned, you're a mother, you're a legislator, former educator, work with HSTA. So uh, hearing the need for more and kind of structural conversations about education is definitely an important insight. Um, so you were mentioning HSTA's uh, campaign and that you were involved uh, with it. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that campaign was? Sure. So in 2015, um, when we were elected, we um, did a listening tour. So we went to all of the chapters, all of the islands, and we talked to teachers about what they thought that were the most pressing concerns mm -hmm. facing teachers and what we could do together to solve them. So basically, what sucked the joy out of their lives and um, what we could do to change that. And um, based on their responses, that we created something called the Speakers Bureau in HSTA. And, and our job was to look at what the teachers had said um, look at the evidence, um, the, the academic scholarship supporting kind of what the teachers were saying, and then create um, really materials that would help the public understand where teachers were coming from and the foundation of what they were arguing for. So, Sounds like a really insightful experience to be able to bring all those resources together. Yeah, and I, I feel really grateful because um, we, NEA gave us a grant so that we could do that work. And it really created a different structure within HSTA. So it was really teacher driven mm -hmm. and teacher voice. So it was really beautiful. And then the, the teachers took those materials to neighborhood boards and to any community organizations that they could talk to. So that was like the beginnings of the School Archaic User Campaign. Right. Well, thank you for that, uh, the history lesson there on, <laughs> on that campaign. Well, we're going to take a short break and be back in just a little bit with Representative Amy Perusa. Aloha and mabuhay. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po. Mabuhay and aloha. Aloha, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. And we're back with the Will of the People. I'm your host, Ian Ross, and I'm sitting down right now with Representative Amy Prusa. Um, so we were, uh, before the break, we were talking about how you might encourage someone to get involved, and you were talking about your experience as an educator and a legislator, uh, and just generally working with neighborhood board systems and stuff like that. One complaint I hear a lot mm -hmm. uh, is that attempts to affect change as a resident, especially on the legislative level, run into many barriers and difficulties. Should it be easier for regular people to affect policy? And if yes, uh, how should we change the process to make it easier? I think that um, there, you know, I think that's a complex question mm -hmm. because I come from California and we have an initiative and referendum system there that has made um, wrong-headed policy possible. <laughs> so, um, in fact, the public school system was partially defunded by Proposition 13, which limited property taxes in California. And so I think that I have um, a, a more complicated view of direct democracy and um, the creation of legislation. I personally think that we should have a longer legislative session. I think that our legislative session is so short and um, I, I think that it truncates the articulation of really important um, arguments and, and voices. And I think part of what I think ha should happen is that, um, well, there are a lot of things that need to change <laughs> to make it more responsive to citizens. But I, I think that, um, 
it, it's a matter of. Um, well, maybe maybe I can make this uh, yeah. a little more specific. <laughs> so, I hear uh, some complaints about a, a few different things. So, one okay. is try not so much gaining touch with legislators. I think oh, the okay. community and the neighborhood board system. Uh, a lot of people say those are pretty good. You go to those. Mm -hmm. You have about 50-50 on each legislator being yeah. there any given month. Yeah. Um, but what I hear a lot about is, you know, the attending of hearings, um, mm. uh, notices being very uh, potentially not being long enough for people to be able to get something together. Uh, another one I often hear about mm. is um, just not knowing the right jargon to talk about. It can be difficult to talk about a bill. As you know, there's mm -hmm. the bill, then there's the House draft version and the Senate draft version. Right. Um, so it, sort of on those levels of someone looking at it and just having a hard time potentially understanding the process or being able to move quick enough to talk to them. I, I know you're talked about extending the legislative session, but is there any other thoughts on that sort of um, the difficulty can exist when you're looking from the outside in? Yeah, I think that, so we have a really fabulous public access room, um, but I think that their work isn't brought into the community that often. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that they can work with neighborhood boards to um, really educate the, the folks who want to be involved or even to community organizations um, and educate them as to how to um, attend hearings. I think that with an extended session, you would have, um, I would hope, uh, longer hearing notices because that's also always been an obstacle for me that it's hard to get leave, you know, be able to take off work mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't have much time. Um, and in terms of like the jargon, I, I do think that um, it's just a matter of immerse, immersing yourself in the process, and and it's just I think you have to learn the language, um, and maybe there can be like that's that's one role the public access room can play, and and those folks can help you understand like different versions, and you know honestly like first lateral and crossover and. And it's hard to keep track of what's happening and, and where you can be most effective, like which access point is going to be the most effective. Um, we'll take a step back there. So you talk about okay. first lateral and crossover. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we're going to get everyone to know all the terms yeah. today. But can you talk about the importance of what these deadlines mean for bills? Right. So um, what, what those deadlines mean is, well, for first lateral, if your bill has not made it through its committees by first lateral, then it's not going to, it, it didn't survive. Mm -hmm. Um, and especially um, if it's not coming, if the same bill is not coming from the Senate side. So uh, it's really important that you understand that if you're going to make a push for it to be heard or to you know, successfully make it through committee, that it, that push has to happen within a certain time frame before, before first lateral. Um, and then, you know, once the bill comes back over, you have to understand the timing too before it goes to conference. And I think that you know, it's, um, there are so many ways a bill can die. <laughs> I think that's really the frustrating thing for people is they don't understand really the point in the process where the conversation ended around the legislation they thought was important. Um, and that's why I think that it, it's the organizing with other people and, and really developing strategies for contacting who the, the main players are around your legislation. So those committee members, right? Um, on the on the relevant committee, so knowing how to identify which committees it's going to go to. To request them to either introduce the bill or hear the bill. Correct. Yeah, and I think, and even the work has to start far before session, like to work with legislators on coming up with language that they're going to be amenable to, right? So you probably need to know like what are going to be the obstacles to the kind of language you're interested in, um, and how you can work with legislators to overcome those obstacles because. Um, it, it's really impossible to just shove things through the legislature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's shift back the discussion back to you personally. Um, this year, you had the experience of introducing bills under your own name for the first time. Uh, there's a limit to how many bills representatives can introduce, right? Correct. Um, so how did you go about deciding which bills you would introduce? Oh, okay. So I basically divided... Um, I, I took first I stepped back and when I was drafting legislation, so this was in November, um, it kind of fell into four buckets pretty easily and, and the legislation was based on all the canvassing I had done. So all the concerns that um, constituents had articulated to me and um, they really fell into economic justice, 
Um, my, my district is um, pretty impoverished. Um, health and human rights. So we really lack access to public health and we have a real serious crisis around houselessness in my oh. district. Um, education. And then Aloha Aina, because um, my district is where Kukani Loko is situated, and then we also have the state ag lands that surround Whitmore Village. So, um, so for people who aren't familiar yeah. with your district, could you tell us a little oh, bit more Wahiwa. about it? Oh, yeah. yeah, so, um, yeah, so it's, a, it's a, well, it's a plant, from some people's perspective, it's an old plantation town, an mm. older plantation town, um, but it's also deeply connected to the originally it's the site of Kukani Loko with, which is the um, birthing place for the Ali'i mm -hmm. so and that has become much more important in recent years and um, there's been a lot of conversation the Kukani Loko plan was just developed by OHA which, and it's a beautiful plan so mm -hmm. um, kind of looking at that and what that means for my district and our community I think it'll be really important. So I think that kind of brings us around to uh, our next question. In which ways are you engaging with your community on the bills you introduced and support? So um, I have been using social media a lot, um, but before, before the session even started, I had a um, pre-legislative, pre-session legislative update, and I basically outlined my bills, and we had um, a potluck dinner, and we all sat around and talked about um, what, which ones the community members thought were the priorities and their positions on it. And we had some like interesting discussions and debates. <laughs> um, but it was, it was really good. I mean, I felt like I wasn't a politician talking mm -hmm. to people. We were having a group conversation. So I enjoyed that. So uh, that seems to be uh, really interesting as the, sort of the way you first picked out the priorities. But now that you're a legislator, is there any type of community... Um, engagement similar to when you were an organizer to get them remind them to show up to any bills or oh, to yeah uh, or is there anything related to perhaps to uh, uh, working with certain groups to support the bills so I've um, been involved like prior to being elected I was involved in a few um, movements so the labor movement the environmental movement and I have been using um, my access and, and helping like informing my networks of when bills are going to be heard and what bills have not yet been heard and should be heard so um just using my communication networks mm. mostly and um i do a something called second saturdays um in wahiwa and people are welcome to come and talk about politics and i use that as an opportunity to to talk about like the issues that are pending and yeah, so basically just like the, and, and neighborhood board meetings to talk about um, what's happening at the legislature. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, one more educator, or as you continue to see yourself, a current <laughs> educator, uh, legislator, mother, uh, someone who uh, didn't expect to see themselves in politics. I really appreciate you sharing your story of um, how this all came together for you and how you continue to take those experiences forward. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Um, so... Uh, we've reached the end of the show. I appreciate you joining me today, Representative, and uh, mahalo to everyone who watched this episode of The Will of the People. This is Ian Ross, signing out.